Ultimately, okay. what we want you to realize and understand is that we as a community, and this community being in this, this village, this village that includes um, Wadley as well as FDA2, this is a village which seeks to embrace all of its young people. Ultimately, that is why we are here. And so with that in mind, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you here today. I'm going to ask you to permit me to just reflect for just a second, uh, because I think it's really important, especially in situations like these, to try and speak from your heart. And I humbly ask you to allow me to speak from my heart for just a second. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. And I don't mind, because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. They say that it's good to live a, a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that right now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the top of the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. And the promised land for us is making sure that our young people are supported and educated. At a time when your son, your baby, your daughter could be killed by a stray bullet just for sitting in a park, that is not what this community is about. That is not our promised land. This is the 50th year of the March on Washington. And this morning, as I came and thought about the essence of what we're going to try and do to say and say today, I thought about those words by Martin Luther King, and that is why I wanted to share those words with you. So in the context of our struggles as a people, that history, that legacy, the dream of making sure that we would not be judged by the color of our skins, but by the content of our character. That is the context in which we welcome you this morning. And this moment is about you, the fathers, and of course, the mothers, those father figures but especially the children, those young brothers and sisters who hold the world in their hands. So thank you for coming today. We have a really great, great program for you. You're going to hear the music of, uh, of Craig Harris. You're going to hear um, Brother Brian Benjamin, who's with uh, Young Professionals United for Change. Um, uh, there's a community of people that we just want you to make contact with. Um, so we're going to start, though, with a very brief, um, uh, shall we say, icebreaker from um, uh, another brother from the community, um, a parent, um, someone who, who cares about our collective community of young people. It takes a village to raise a child. So we're going to uh, welcome um, Mr. Joseph Fagan, uh, and he's graciously consented to support this moment and this energy and this day. Uh, and he's going to provide you with a very brief icebreaker. So thank you, Mr. Joseph Fagan. Good morning. I just want to welcome you. How many dads we have here today? Put your hands up. Oh, we're packed with dads. All right. So that's excellent. We're just going to find out what we have in common this morning. So we want to loosen it up as early, get our bones moving a little bit. So just bear with me. I'm going to ask you to stand up. If I make a statement that you agree with and remain seated, 
if you disagree, okay? So stand up if you agree, and you can remain seated if you disagree or it doesn't apply to you, all right? But before we do that, I just want you to turn to somebody next to you and give them a little dap. Let's give each other a little love today, a little eye contact, say good morning, say what's up, what's up, how you doing? Turn to the person behind you and say what's going on. How are you doing, brother? What's going on? All right. We got to loosen it up a little bit, all right? It's a great day when we can get fathers together and acknowledge people. Let's get some eye contact. Let's see. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. So, so we, we want to get that done. So here we go, real quickly, all right? If you're a Giants fan, please stand up. All right, get back up. We got our Giants fans in here, all right? Let's sit back down, all right? If you're a Jets fan, please stand up. That's right, right here. Uh-oh, uh-oh, here's our Jets fans. We got our Jets fans in here. If you're a Nick fan, please stand up. Right here. Uh-oh, we got a lot of Nick fans here. Uh-oh. Yeah, is that a Nick fan? All right, if you're a Nets fan, please stand up. Uh-oh, we don't have no Nets fans here today. All right, all right, all right. Okay, there's nobody down with the, with the Brooklyn Nets, okay? If you believe that the Giants are going to win the NFC division, stand up. Oh, my brother believes that, all right? All right, so I might point to you and ask you to speak on one or two things if, if you agree, all right? If you believe that spending quality time with your son or daughter is very important, please stand up. Yeah, we got everybody here believes that quality time is important with your father, I mean, with your son or your daughter. All right, if you believe having a healthy relationship with your son or daughter's mother is important, please stand up. All right? I'm, I'm going to put somebody on the spot. Mr. Benjamin, speak on that for me. Why do you think it's important to have a healthy relationship with your son or daughter's um, mother? Well... I don't have a child, but I spoke <laughs> from the perspective of my parents. Uh, my father left when I was young, and I didn't really have a relationship with him. And because of the, the, the issues between him and my mom, I never got to build a relationship with him, and that has been with me for a long time. So that, that's why I stood up, because it, it happened to me. And this is not just about dads. It's about uncles and godfathers and caregivers and everybody that wants to support our children. If, and I tell the young people all the time, if dad is, is not around, find a dad. Find somebody you can relate to. Find somebody who can give you good information. So that's very important. Okay, so let's talk to the men a little bit. Let's, it, who do you think is, is better, um, Sainer Lathan or Beyonce? If you agree, Sainer Lathan is better. Who, let's, let's, let's talk it out. Sainer Lathan? All right, Sainer Lathan, all right, for Beyonce. Anybody? All right, we got some Beyonce in here. Sanai, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm saying it all wrong. Beyonce. Uh, we got the point. We got the point. All right, good, 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 good. So the other thing, do you agree with this, uh, this statement right here? If you agree or you disagree, all right? Now I'll pick somebody on the spot, all right? You don't have to um, have a job to be a great dad. You don't have to have a job to be a great dad. You agree or disagree? If you agree, stand up. All right, I'm going to ask the sister, oh, no, she don't want to speak on it. Brother, you want to speak oh, on that I'm point? Say okay, well, we just want somebody to kind of validate that point. Who stood up. Remain standing if you agree that you don't have a job, don't have to have a job to be a great dad. Do you want to speak on that, brother, just on how you feel in the back? Anybody? Sure. I think it takes a lot of courage just to be a father. So whether you have a job or not, raising that child is the most important job. Yeah. That's that's an important point. Any yeah, brother speak on it. Um, I feel like a father you know, um, doesn't make you a bad father. Um, if your child, if, 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 if your child sees you making effort, that makes you know what I mean? at least you, she see she or he see that you make an effort. So I mean that you know I mean, that shows potential in your child to pick with that, knowing that you're not a loser and you're not a quitter. So they pick up along that. So, hey, let's get some work. <laughs> And, and I'm going to close with that because there's so many myths about being a great father. Children need emotional development. They need social development. They need uh, intellectual development. They need spiritual de development. And sure, having a job is important to support your child over the long run. But guess what? That job is going to come. you got to be there for your child. So having a job is not... The most important thing, being there for your child. So I just want to give a warm welcome. Give yourself a hand. Please enjoy the program today. Thank you.
principals in this school, um, FDA2 as well as uh, Wadley. Unfortunately, the principal of Wadley uh, uh, isn't uh, here today. Uh, he had um, an unforeseen commitment, and we extend apologies and his welcome. But we do have the principal of, of FDA2 here, Mr. Freer. So we'd like him to come forth and speak. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Ase Owusu Afriye. I am the principal of Frederick Douglass Academy 2 here on this campus. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, we'd like to welcome all of you to the campus. This is a very important day. I think sometimes we don't get, as fathers, as a father myself, I don't think sometimes in our community we get the props that we deserve, and sometimes we try to demonize our work that we do with our children. So to show that today we're all here to celebrate, to honor, to support our children, I think is important keep the involvement going going forward. There's a lot of great work that's happening within this building that needs to be celebrated, needs to be promoted, and it's all of you that will be able to go out and share that with everyone. So enjoy the program today, and thank you so much for coming to, to the event. We're pleased to have um, today from the mayor's office, Mr. Alan Farrell. Uh, so we'd like to give him an opportunity. Thank you so much for the dads that are here this morning, um, and the moms and the students. So good to see you. Again, uh, my name is Alan Farrell. I am the Fatherhood Services Coordinator for the City of New York. Um, how many of you knew that we had a fatherhood initiative in New York City? Wow, right? I mean, so it's something that is growing. Uh, this Friday actually will be uh, my third year in this role. And uh, it's actually when I started uh, over three, year, three years ago, my first opportunity to serve was part of Dads Take Their Child to School, which is part of a statewide event that's happening today, uh, all around the state, and here in New York City. We started out with one school in Brooklyn, and now there are over 400 schools all around the state. Uh, this was birthed out of the Million Father March in Chicago, where dads were encouraged to not only take their kids to school, but for fathers that when you're in high school to come in to the school and continue to show their support um, as their kids grow in terms of their education. Um, this is just a really exciting day for me. Um, my wife and I live in this community. Uh, we live uh, 119th, Frederick Douglass, right here. And we are expecting a son. With that, I'm looking forward to the day where I'll be sitting where you're sitting, <laughs> right? With uh, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors in high school. But I'm sort of at the beginning of it, and you're sort of at the, uh, at the tail, uh, tail end, at least. Of young people not only entering college, but actually graduating from college. And we're just going to see stronger families and stronger communities. Um, that's just the bottom line. Um, a lot of times uh, we look at a dad take your child to school day, and I've heard people say, well, what about the moms? And we can see that there are moms here. Uh, I don't know if there are aunts, right, grandmothers, but you're here. And we know that, and we celebrate that every day in our community. But oftentimes, I think, as someone uh, mentioned earlier, we don't take the time to stop and say, fathers, you are welcome in the school community. Fathers, you are welcome uh, here in our community to uh, stand up and be counted um, as being involved in the lives of your children in terms of their education. And so with that, I, I just have to say, this is just a wonderful event. I'm so excited to be here, so excited to see so many fathers, uncles, uh, extended family members here uh, standing for their children and for our children. So again, thank you so much again for being here uh, and happy dads take your child to school day. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for participating. We are very excited about this program this morning. Um, we are excited that Wadley and FD are participating. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers for you this morning. You are really in for a treat. So again, welcome. Please enjoy the day and thank you. Well, there's a brother who um, is a former Black Panther. Um, uh, I initially heard about him even before I came to Georgia. Um, and I happened to have taken a position as a librarian um, at a school about 10 blocks north of here. Um, and I was new to New York, being a country boy. I know cotton fields and you know, uh, I know um, water drawn from wells and, you know, chopping wood. That's kind of like where I come from. But anyway, I, I was here in New York. I'd taken a job as a librarian. And on this particular day, I can see it 
as vividly as I'm talking now. I was walking upstairs to the library, third floor, and down comes this brother with his wife. This brother embraced me with his spirit. And as I said to him on a number of occasions, you know, being sort of the shy person that I am, I hadn't really found my groove. And, and, uh, but yet, you know, you, you try and do the best you can. And he embraced me with his spirit. Um, subsequently, I asked him to come to Wadley. And he's been here on a number of occasions throughout the years. And he's spoken to the young brothers and sisters in the Watley community. So I affirm him and affirm that energy and appreciate him because every time I've asked him to come and speak to a young brother or sister, he's been right there. You know, and that's, that's, that's a sacred calling. Um, so, we have all of these examples. I mentioned earlier that this is the 50th year of the March in Washington. We, when you think of people like Fannie Lou Hamer, and we think of people like um, Martin Luther King, you know, or even Malcolm, brothers and sisters who walk this community and who no longer are here. But we stand on their shoulders. We walk in their legacy. And this brother is a part of that legacy. So um, when he said that he would come today, I just wanted to give him a minute to kind of speak the word to you. And we, we, we thank you for your patience. Uh, again, I, I said to Ms. Green earlier, we're going to try and keep it tight because we're here to hear the peer pastor. But you know, there's, there's some kernels of truth that we just want you to, to, to taste. So brother, Jamal Joseph. Fathers, good morning mothers, good morning children, students, mentors. Um, I never knew my dad. But I was blessed to have a lot of fathers. Uh, I was blessed coming up through Minnesota Townhouse and City Mission Society, being mentored in the Cadet Corps, the Order of the Rites of Passage Program, in the Black Panther Party, um, through my prison experiences, my post-prison experiences as an educator, as an artist, activist. There were men of conscience and caring who were around that understood even before I understood that I was their son and that they could live an example that I could follow. One of the greatest pieces of advice that I heard about parenting comes from Maya Angelou and I was actually uh, part of the Panther 21 case and was in prison and there was a guard of conscience named Abdul Kareem who would bring us books and let us watch educational programming. And through the bars, we were watching a program called Soul that came on Channel 13, hosted by Ellis Hazlip. Gideon, I know you remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Maya Angelou was talking about parenting, and she said, here's what I learned about being a mother. You don't have to be perfect, but you need to be available. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fathers, I want to say to you that that is the greatest gift that you have. Don't be intimidated that there might be math problems that you don't know how to solve. Don't be intimidated that there might be some music that you don't quite understand, some slang you don't quite understand, something digitally you don't quite understand. Be available because that takes root. Last summer I was walking down the street with my son who had just gotten his master's degree from Columbia and there was a young man standing by a bus stop. He was about 35 years old. And he said, Mr. Joseph, Professor Joseph, how are you? I said, I'm fine. He said, you don't remember me. You were in a youth program, he says, I was in a youth program called Changing Scenes. And Changing Scenes is a program where kids who were on probation were mandated to take some leadership classes and some, some theater classes. And I was teaching one of the theater classes. This goes back about 20 years ago. He said, you don't remember me, but I was one of the young men in that class. And he said, and I was a knucklehead. And of course, I went right in the mode. No, young brother, you weren't. He says, no, trust me. <laughs> he said, I was a knucklehead. He said, but every week you would come. You would be on time. You would give us something positive. He says, and it didn't take hold then. He said, but a couple of years later, it kicked in. And I'm so glad to see you because I'm a father now. And I'm a social worker now. Thank you for not giving up. Fathers, thank you for not giving up. Let us know we don't have to be perfect but available. Mothers, thank you for not giving up. We're not perfect, but available. Young people, thank you for not giving up. We're not perfect, but we're available. And since we're available to each other and hear the spirit of love, this family will continue to grow. Representatives from 
some of the various uh, politicians who represent us who are here today to let you know that they support this initiative and that they support this community. Um, Mr. Outlaw from our recently re-elected Councilwoman Dickens is here and we'd like you just to kind of embrace him for just a moment and, and embrace the spirit with which uh, he's here to represent uh, that, uh, uh, that office. Uh, on behalf of um, Councilwoman Inez Dickens, uh, Mr. Outlaw. I want to thank everyone for coming out on behalf of the Councilwoman um, she apologized that she couldn't be here due to uh, another conflict, but that it is so important that um, fathers, like myself, I'm, I'm a father now, I have a one-year-old. Um, Pastor Waldron uh, baptized my son. Um, and it, it is very important that us as, as fathers, as, especially as minority fathers, that we participate in our child's, our children's uh, way of life and their everyday, what they do every day, not just on the weekends or not just um, part time or summertime or winter, but it's very important that we're in, in their lives every day and that we do what we need to do to show them that there is a, a male role model who cares and they should look up to us first and then maybe look up to someone like a Michael Jordan or someone like a, a Floyd Mayweather or something like that. Um, but I just wanted to say that we really appreciate program like this and that we want to continue to not just have a few fathers but as many fathers as possible to come out and participate in this program. Thank you guys for listening to me. Thank you very briefly. Mr. Benjamin is with Young Professionals United for Change and again he's the architect of one of those organizations which has been very supportive of our young people in this community. Um, one of the things that he's done um, among others is to bring a, a, a group of um, students from Howard to Wadley to speak to the young ladies and young men in Wadley. Last May, he was the architect of a program which brought a, a group of um, professionals from various disciplines, um, lawyers, um, uh, political activists, mathematicians, to this space in the library. They went into the various classrooms and they spoke to, spoke to our students. Uh, so we just want to make sure that you are aware of the kind of support in this village, this love of people who support our young people. And very briefly, he's just going to speak to you, and we wanted you to put a face. We wanted to put a face on that particular initiative. Thank you. I'll be I'll be, be brief. Thank you, um, Brian Benjamin, Tony Harlow. Um, my as I said, as I said earlier, my uh, father. Um, I didn't know him growing up but I did know my, my stepfather, and I want to pick up on the point about availability. Between my two parents, neither of them graduated eighth grade, but both of them were always available um, and were there for me, and I think that that's as valuable as an offering that you can have, because I ended up going off to Brown University, like Senator Perkins, and uh, Harvard Business School, and a lot of that had to do with parents who just said they believed that the education system would work for their child and they fought, even though they had no idea what I was doing or no idea what they were spending the money for me to, to be doing. And so I appreciate that. And part of the reason why I'm here is because I recognize while they gave me that love and support, which is so critical, I also had to reach out to people who I didn't know who weren't family members to help me put the pieces together and make the, and make those make those steps. So we have we have started a program here at Wally where we bring in young professionals who've gone to the, the best schools and who've done all these great things, lawyers, doctors, some of them live right around the corner, but don't, but aren't a part of a school structure. So we, every Friday, we're having someone come from a whole different background, whether it's a lawyer, or Dr. Obama's um, uh, folks, et cetera, to speak. And we are working with the seniors. This is a new pro program I just spoke with Principal Chin about. We're gonna work with the seniors to really try to help them with the college application process and getting into college. And so, very excited about it. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for your time and I wish you the best of luck. We also have Mr. Austin from uh, ACS. We're gonna ask him just a very brief yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Speak to you. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I know more than likely you heard from Mr. Alan Farrell from the, from the mayor's office. I work at the Administration for Children's Services. Um, we're in a unique position. I know many, many of you may have heard of my agency, ACS, um, and many whatever stories, but we protect children. But it came, it came to us at ACS that we could play a strategic role in helping to 
bring this movement forward. You may know and you might not know what you're doing today is replicated throughout the city in many, many different schools of bringing the fathers or the fa bringing the fathers bringing their children to school. This is just one stage in an ongoing effort to get fathers more involved with their children. But like I said, the ACS, we played a strategic role in helping bring this throughout the city because, as you know, ACS is almost a, in every borough, in every community because we protect children. So we have our ground forces out, those same people who knock on doors and ask how your children are doing. We have them now being proactive and trying to get the fathers involved. We're trying to get ahead of them. Instead of being reactive, we're being proactive. And you men that's here, I commend you. I really do. But this is a movement that's not just for this day. This is one step in an ongoing effort for us men to handle our business, regardless if you're with the mother or not, to handle our business and be in our children's lives. It's more important to, for, to be present as opposed to presence, all right? And one thing I need to say that we said, we, we, I'm going around to the different schools. One thing is important to let your children know that you love them. Have that conversation that you love them and you're there for them. Some of us have our stories, we, we forgot that part. Okay, we forgot that part. And we forgot the part how a disintegration of a relationship can damage a child. If you don't be straightforward and explain to them what happened. I have a story, my daughter wilded out when I left the relationship. Many years later, she had a conversation with me. Why did you leave me? And it wasn't about her. It's important that we have conversation with our children and at the same time tell them we love them and we're there for them. And fathers, it's not a one-shot deal. Your children to school and everything else. To build a positive role model in a positive community. This is about our community. So your child, so I don't have to worry about your child. Okay? Because also it's about us, but the company they keep. If you handle your child, they don't have to worry about my child. It has a ripple effect. Thank you. Brother, Brother Craig Harris, again, graciously consented to come here. Uh, and I asked him at the last minute, uh, so we just want to welcome him. And, um, and, and grace him. I know you're wearing many hats today, Paul, but I know everybody thinks musicians wake up like noon, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we stay up all night. It's not so. I'm supposed to be in the studio in uh, half an hour. And that's why, that's why I have to be. Uh, does anybody know, every, know, know the adults, young people? Do you know what, what this is? What instrument this is? Any young people? They raise your hand and then, see this one? And, okay, so nobody knows what they see. And this, okay, so when I walk into these doors, and not, not, not older people, the young people, it says performing wildly, performing arts and visual school. And you don't know what this instrument is. It says performing art and visual, and that's sad. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not, and I'm, I'm saying this with love. Everything I'd say is with love. This is a trombone. A trombone, okay? So teachers, principals, take back to that. It says performing arts up there, and they don't know what this instrument is. Okay? I've been playing this instrument 51 years, since I was nine years old. Okay, it has, it has, it has, music in our community is so important. If you, I've traveled, you go to my website, craigsharris.com, you've seen I've done this for a long time. I have maybe 40 CDs out as a leader, and I've played music with probably all from Lena Horn to The Roots. Okay? Uh, and I live right around the corner. That's my brother <coughs> right there. We see that we come up in this community together. We've been here a long time. And music in our community is the essence. I don't, you know, I like words. I like all kinds of books. But the mu our essence of our community in our DNA is our music. It's the unspoken word. I have a friend from Saudi Arabia, and he just doesn't understand why, he says, why African Americans don't, run the United States with the culture that they produce. Because we don't, we don't own our culture. And I'm not, and I'm not gonna lecture too long, but music has always, as a kid, I was 13 years old, and my mother, I was, I was a sing, my single, single parent family, once again. My mother never had to worry about me because of music. 
because uh, I had you know something to do. It was always me and my friends. We just like like they do like the rappers now. They get their little beats and they get their, their rhymes together. We got our instruments together. We get in the house and we just play music all the time. So she never had to worry about me with no gang stuff because you know they in that basement making that noise. I'd be glad when they stop <laughs> making that music. Uh, in my first gig as a, as a professional musician, I was 13 years old. We worked in a strip club. I know that, right? <laughs> we had worked, in, but we were very good, and they brought us into the club. They, they, well, Mr. Winslow had the station wagon. He held our chaperone. That's what I was one of my extended fathers. Mr. Winslow took, picked us up in the station wagon, took us into the strip club. We played there Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, and he took us out right after. <laughs> right after, he said, "Okay, it's time for y'all to go," and we went in. And we went out. But that was supervision. And other kids be bragging what they saw Friday morning. We couldn't even say what we saw Friday morning. <laughs> but Mr. Winslow was always there. He said, all right, Harris, Gardner, in the car. And we was out of there. But I'm just saying, music has brought me through so much. And music is so important. So please try to get you some music in your community. You know, even if, 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 if you're old school and you don't like the hip hop and all that, still embrace it. Embrace it. Embrace it. Work with them. And then you can nourish somebody in their, in their rap and they write other rhymes. Now I'm going to play something for you that you're not going to know nothing about. Because it took me 51 years to get to this. And I'm still working on it. But go check out people like Miles Davis, John Coltrane, David Murray, Arthur Black. individuals in this community who brings the power of his spirit to try and support the young brothers and sisters of this community. And he's made a, a number of visits to Wadley. A couple of times he was in the library uh, and did just what he did today in sharing of himself with those young brothers and sisters 
in that library right across the wall. When we had um, Cornel West was here, that brother opened up, and he came with that same spirit. So we have to thank you. We're going to bring Pastor Mike up. Um, um, but before I do that, um, uh, we just want to again applaud and acknowledge the fathers and father figures by, by, by applauding you. It takes a village to raise this child. Mr. But Pastor Mike, what he has brought to this community and what First Corinthian Church has done to try and, and, and empower our young people it is, is, is really something that uh, is approaching a legend. Um, there was a, an experience when I was, it was a Sunday morning, and I mentioned this to Pastor Mike when we were talking previously. Uh, there was a sister I know who was a Yoruba priestess. And um, I saw her, and, and I asked her where she was headed. And she told me that she was going to First Corinthians. And, you know, I was, I was quite surprised. As the conversation evolved, she told me that she was going to hear Pastor Mike because, no, my brother, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Because, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because she goes, even though she was a Yoruba priestess, she goes where the light is. So there's a light in this community, and Pastor Mike in First Corinthian has been very supportive of Wadley and our students. For those of you who don't know, Wadley was under threat of closure, and it still is. Um, but brothers like Pastor Mike and, and, and members of his uh, community, when I say his community, his, his spiritual community, they've been right here to try and support us. And that's, that's something that, that we want all of you to know. Um, again, I don't know what to say. I'm at a loss for words when I think of this brother. But I, I'm just going to, as I'm thinking, I, I remember something that our Sterling Brown said. And I won't share all of it. But Sterling Brown said, they dragged you from homeland. They chained you in couples. They huddled you spoon fashion in filthy hatches. They sold you to give a few gentlemen ease. They broke you in like oxen. They scourged you. They branded you. They swelled your numbers with bastards. They taught you the religion they disgraced. But you sang, keep a inching along like a poet's word. You sang, walk together, chill, and don't you get weary. You sang, by and by, I'm going to lay down this heavy load. The strong men keep a coming on, getting stronger. Strong men, stronger. I won't finish that. But as I was standing here, uh, those words came to me. Sterling Brown, strong men. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Pastor Mike to the village of Wadley again. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here this morning. I thank Paul again for the invitation. I always find great joy in sharing in any way I can with the Wanley family. I, in particular, on this day, we honor the commitment of our fathers. I have to thank all those who have spoken and to our musician, and to my, I tell you, my big brother, a mentor, all that. And a guiding light in this city and the nation and a guiding light in my life. And I'm, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful for people like that who have mentored, who have been there, who have been part of my own personal journey. Uh, but today, as we celebrate uh, fathers taking their children to school, I want to start with my own story. And I won't be long today. I'll be very brief. But I want to start with my story of taking my child, uh, my son, to school for the first time. A very strange story. I was a freshman in college. I went to Morehouse College and I was a freshman there. In September of my freshman year, 1989, I met a young lady who is now my wife, but I met her. And we started what I thought at 18 was this whirlwind romance. And I was head over heels, nose wide open for this <laughs> sister, all right? 
And I mean, she had me all over the place, man. <laughs> and we, I, I, and part of the issue was we were focusing more on us than we were on school. We didn't do too great that first year. In fact, she didn't do well at all, so much so her father, her stepfather at the time, who was paying for her education, decided she could not come back to school. And she was a student at Spelman College. And so he wanted her to stay in Texas. He wanted her to get focused and get her grades together. And so here I was, this young man, eight, well now 19, as a, as a end of my freshman year. And during that summer, uh, my mother can tell you that that phone bill was ridiculous. That was pre-cell phone where landline bills would get outrageous if you made long distance calls and my long distance bill for my mother's phone in, in one month was like $300 in 1990. That was grounds for getting in serious trouble with my mother and I did. But I asked my girlfriend at the time, I said, can I come visit you? I just want to see her. She wasn't coming back to school, I didn't think, and I wanted to see her. Well, uh, I had to ask her mother. I didn't know anything about this. I wasn't from the South. I was not, I, my family was from Barbados. I was raised in New York. And so when I called her to see if I could come, she was like, you need to talk to my mother. And so I talked to her mother, and her mother shut me down. She said, no, you are not coming to see my daughter. But her grandmother became my advocate. Never met the woman, but she felt that I must have really cared about her granddaughter. She would hear her granddaughter talking about me all the time, and I came. Now maybe she was being, maybe the mother had some insight we didn't have, but anyway, long story short, I went that summer, it was August 1990, and came back to school late August at Morehouse. And in October, I got a call from my girlfriend, and she told me she was pregnant. And it completely shook me. So you understand the visit in August. <laughs> I get the call two months later and she was pregnant. And so uh, I was blessed at that time. My father worked for TWA, that's now gone, but I could fly free. So I would fly from Atlanta to Texas to, deal, to go with her to her pregnancy classes. So every week I would get on the plane, go to Texas, and go to these classes with her and the breathing and all that kind of stuff. And in May of 91 now, this is my sophomore year, I'm 19 years old, I finished my finals on May 13th of that year. I went from Morehouse, I went to Houston, Texas. My son was born May 18th of 1991. And her mother now, my wife's mother, my girlfriend at the time, was committed to seeing her daughter not just finish school, but to go back to Spelman to graduate. So that summer I stayed in Texas most of the summer with my son, and then come August we made our way back to college. I went back to Morehouse, she went to Spelman, and her mother decided to do us a tremendous favor, and that was what? Watch my son, take care of my son while we were in school. But you have to understand, my son was only three months old, my wife, girlfriend at the time, was going through it, having to leave her child 800 miles away with her mother. And here I was a father for the first time, and, and someone else was watching my child. And so I went to school, started that sophomore year, um, or rather junior year, at Morehouse. And we went to a convocation. At Morehouse, you had to go to convocation every Thursday. And they would bring in speakers from around the country to come speak and inspire us young men to be great. And there was a particular speaker who was a pastor in Detroit, Michigan. His name was Charles Adams. And he preached a sermon. And the title of the sermon was, Where Are the Men? And the scripture he used was the passage in Genesis when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. When they ate of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, they became aware of their nakedness. They uh, designed clothes, so to speak, to cover themselves up, and they hid from God. And the scripture says that God came through the garden in the cool of the day and raised the piercing question. He said, Adam, where are you? Where are you? And it wasn't that God did not know where Adam was. I mean, God created the garden. God created every space in the garden. It's hard, hard to hide from the person who created the hiding places, right? <laughs> and, so, and so he's saying, where are you? It is not a question of geography, but he knew God knew something was off, that the connection was now different. The connection had shifted because Adam had become disobedient. And Charles Adams spoke of this sermon, and he asked us all, 2,000 plus men in this chapel, he said, where are the men? Because in days like 
like these, in moments like these, in seasons like these, he said, we need men. And he said something that day. He said, we need men to be in the lives of their children. He said, no excuses are good when it comes to being a father. We need men to be in the lives of their children. By the end of Reverend Adams' sermon, I was in tears. I felt absolutely horrible because here I was, a man at 20, and my son was not with me, and a woman was raising my son, and I was enjoying the college life in Atlanta, Georgia, while someone bore the responsibility of raising my son. And so that was around September. I went to the dean at Morehouse, and I asked the dean of students at Morehouse, I said, let me ask you a question. Is there any policy against children being on campus? He said, no, we've never had that here. I said, so there's no policy. So if there's no policy, that means there's no rule. I said, so what if I brought my son to school with me? He said, well, I don't really know about that. He said, maybe you can talk to your resident director in your dorm. I went to my resident director, and he said, I said, what about the possibility of my son coming to school with me? He said, I never heard of that. We never had that. You need to talk to your RA, the one who runs the floor. <laughs> I go to the RA. I asked the RA. I said, my son, I want to bring my son. My RA said to me, you need to talk to your roommate. <laughs> And let me, tell you, let me tell you how God works. Now, I've been at First Corinthians for nine years. My roommate in 1991 was my predecessor at First Corinthian Baptist Church. He actually ended up pastoring the church before I did, and he was my roommate for three semesters. I spoke to him. I said, man, look, I want to bring my son to school. You got a problem with that? And he told me no. So I went back to the RA, went back to the RD, went back to the dean, and I said, I'm going to get my son. Did not tell my girlfriend. I called her mother. I told her. On Friday, this was a Tuesday, I'm coming to get my son. She said, what do you mean? I said, I'm coming to get him. She said, how are you going to do it? I said, I'll figure it out. But I want to get my son. I got a ticket from my father that Friday. On the, well, after I spoke to my wife's mother, then I told her I'm going to get Trey. And that Friday, I flew to Houston, Texas. She packed my son's bags. I got the little portable crib. And on that next day, flew back to Atlanta, Georgia, and my son spent the entire junior year of my college career in my dorm with me. Ooh. All right? So, so, so I brought my son, literally, to school with me and to live with me on campus because I felt in my heart of hearts, I knew it was going to be hard, I knew it was going to be tough, and I knew it would be a struggle trying to negotiate classes. And I was the only brother on a campus of over 2,000 men pushing the stroller <laughs> some days. There were days when my classes and my girlfriend's classes overlapped, so we would have to alternate who would have the child in class. I'd be in the back of the classroom and praying that he would be sleeping. <laughs> but that's what it was. That's what I did. And it was difficult. Let me not make any loop. It was hard trying to be a father and trying to be in school, on campus, in a dorm room, and raise a child. But what it taught me is that if you choose to make excuses, that's a choice you make. Because there's no thing that should stop you from being involved in the life of your child. And the only thing that will stop you are your own excuses. But even those excuses can be transcended and overcome. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. That question that Dr. Adams asked me stayed with me until the very moment I brought my son back to Morehouse College, and that is, where are the men? Where are the men? And the good news is this morning, there's a room full of fathers in here who do not find shame in being with their children, and you should applaud that. But a few things, but a few things I want to share, though, that I think are critical, that I learned over these years and learned in that very moment in September of 1991. I learned something, and I want to share this with the fathers who are here today, and maybe something may help. Maybe something may stay, may stick. But what I learned, the first thing I learned in September of 1991, 20 years old, raising a child on a college campus, was this. Never let your inadequacies be an excuse. None of us in here are perfect. None of us in here have done everything right all the time. There is no father in this room today who can say they've always made the right choice, made the best decisions, always done what was best for you, your child. None of us can say that. But what we can say is that we did not get stuck at the place of our mistake. That is important. 
because we will never be all that we think we can be. But here's the thing, as was already said, that sometimes it's not perfection that is required, it's availability. Right. It is a capacity to be there, imperfections and all, and not allow those things that we've done wrong, the flaws we have, the mistakes we've made, to be an excuse from our own involvement in the lives of our children. Because you will continue, as long as you live, to make mistakes. It is not the mistake that defines you. It is how you overcome the mistake once you experience it and then transcend even your own limitations. That's what I learned. There were many things I had to fight through in 1991 in September. I had to study and feed a child. I had to deal with a roommate who had girlfriends who wanted to come by. There were days I had to take my son into the study hall across the hall because my roommate's girlfriend would come over. I had to do all kinds of, I had to make adjustments because I wanted to be present. I wanted to be there. And my own deficiencies, my own limitations were not an excuse any longer. I could not use those things as a crutch. And I know it's so easy to use our limitations as a crutch, especially when it comes to being a father. What do we hear? Well, my father wasn't there. Right. Well, I don't know how to raise a child because my father wasn't around. Those are all excuses to me. Because those are things that you don't use an excuse, you use as an obstacle to overcome right. and to become more of who you can be. Because here's what I discovered. You never know what you're capable of doing until it is necessary in defining who you are as a man. I'm part of an organization, a fraternity called Make a Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated. And we have four cardinal principles, and our first cardinal principle is called manhood. It is understanding that to be a man is not about the capacity to see how many women you have or how many women you've been with. It's about taking responsibility, and you all have demonstrated that today. But it's something that so many brothers in our community have not understood, that manhood has nothing to do with the money in your pocket or the women you have on speed dialing your cell phone. <laughs> it has to do with the ability to not only make decisions, but stand by decisions and be honorable in those decisions, to be dependable, to be available. So I had to learn that my inadequacies were not an excuse. And then here's the thing, brothers, we got to know, and sisters too, who are here, the worst thing to do, I like music in the background, actually. That's okay, I, I can work with that, I can work with that. The other thing you have to understand is this, and here it is. See, because I, I told Jamal, I'm really a jazz musician at the end of the day. I love jazz, I wish I was, but, so this helps me do it better now, right? So, just turn it down a little bit. But, 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 but here's the thing, not only can your inadequacies not be an excuse, but you cannot raise your children through your fears. Right. How many of us have raised our children trying to prevent them from experiencing what we've experienced, only to create in them resentment towards us? Because at the end of the day, you've made mistakes, but guess what? Your child will make mistakes, and that's okay. The same way you learned, the same way you overcame, is the same way they will as well. But don't raise a child based on your fear, because you'll suffocate them. You'll cut them off from breathing, from living, from experiencing life the way they ought to. And we've all made those mistakes again. But when you begin to raise your child through the lenses of your mistakes, you never help them learn what it means to live and thrive. And so, never use your inadequacies as an excuse. Never raise your child through your fears, Father. And here's the last thing I'll get out your way this morning. Here's this. As a father, you bear the responsibility for many things. But the one thing I've come to discover as a father is that you bear the responsibility of casting a vision yes. before your, your child. Yes. To show them the possibilities and what can be. You embody potential and possibility, and you demonstrate that just by being in their life. When they see you work and strive, when they see you struggle to make it, when they see you go out of your way to do, when they see you sacrifice and show up, you are casting a vision for them of what they can do and what they can be. And so many of our young men and women have lost that capacity because too many of us, fathers, me, us, have forsook our responsibilities. And so even though you're here today, you have responsibility for other fathers as well. Those who you know need a little push, a little nudge, so they can be even better than what they are at the moment. But you bear the responsibility of showing your child what can be. And guess what? Here's the deep part. Showing your child what can be has to even transcend who you are. Yes. Because if you limit your child because of your own limitations, that means they begin to be a replication of who you are. And at the end of the day, if you're a father like me, you want your child to be better and more 
So you cast the vision. You don't put a ceiling of limitation over your child's head. You don't start speaking negatively into their life, telling them what they can't do and who they can't be. You always cast a bigger vision that transcends your limitations and even transcends the insanity they see daily. Because if you live in this community, there will be some insane things you will see. There will be crime and there'll be drugs and there will be all kinds of pathological behaviors that manifest themselves because of our own trauma that we experience in this community. But you have to push them past that because being available is one thing, but being a visionary in your own house is something different. And you have the ability to be a visionary in your house, in your child's life. And so that's what I leave with you today as fathers who are here, who made the choice to show up who've made the decision to be available, who've made the decision to be present, always carry with you. One, that your inadequacies are never an excuse. Two, don't lead your child through your fears. And three, don't be afraid to show them who they can be. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if you do that, if you honor who you are and honor the best of who you are, you have no idea the potential you will unleash in your child. And I close with this, my son, who spent the first year of his life on Morehouse College campus. As I was raising him, a young father, 21, 22, 23, we grew up together. I would always try to show him different images of who and what he could be. And I would try to speak into him and speak life into him. It was difficult because I was out of Morehouse. I went to graduate school at Duke University and I was in school trying to raise a child. And then we had another child on the way. And so here I was, 24 years old, with two children in school, working two jobs, married, trying to raise a family, and still trying to encourage them and push them and cast the vision of who they could be. If you do that, if you do that, don't be surprised when they become visionaries themselves. Don't be surprised when they embrace the dream. And that sacrifice, 22, now 23 years ago, that pushing, that getting past, that not being fearful, getting over what seemed like a limitation has yielded tremendous fruit. So today, I stand, the father, of a 22-year-old senior at Morehouse College. Yes. Who, who, when my son went to Morehouse, they had changed the names of the dorms around. His freshman dorm was a dorm he stayed in the first year of his life. Wow. That shows you how things come all the way back around. My daughter is a sophomore across the street at Spelman College. Yes. You cast that vision. You tell them what can be. You lift it up before them and you have no idea what they will become. You have no idea what can come back to you if you make that sacrifice now. And so I thank you for this opportunity, Paul, Lena, but most of all, I commend all of you who are here today because it is no small thing that you took this time today to be here to support the life of your young person, your child, your daughter, your son, your grandson, your nephew, your niece, whoever, you made that decision, but here it is, don't stop it. Keep on pushing. Keep on persevering, and it does not yet appear where you shall be. God bless. Thank you all. But then I, I remember something that, um, I think it was Emerson or Washington Irving who said, that um, there's a sacredness in tears. They're not a sign of weakness, but of strength and overwhelming love. Uh, so that, that thought, those lines visit me whenever I, I get a little misty eye when I when I hear this brother speaking. Um, because, you know, I, again, I'm getting a little personal. I grew up uh, in Augusta, Georgia. And it's interesting when Pastor Mike, the last conversation he had, he had mentioned that he, if, if memory serves me correctly, there was a church, Spring Hill Church, Springfield Church in Augusta, Georgia, that um, was responsible for Morehouse College being in, in existence. It's, it was founded, if, if memory serves me correctly, right? if, I, if I recall what he said to me, um, Springfield Church in Augusta, Georgia, where I was born and raised and grew up, um, was where Morehouse College began. And subsequently, this brother went to Morehouse and became a minister. And I didn't know this. We're sitting and we're having this conversation, and he shares that with me. So I took that as being another one of those spiritual moments. Little old me from Augusta, Georgia, sitting, talking to this brother who has contributed his voice to changing the world. So I consider it 
sacred, and I, and I thank you, sir. What I'm going to ask is, as you begin to prepare to leave, to connect with the fathers in this room, remember that this school and there are persons in this community that embrace you and, and we love you and we, we, we try and extend that love to your children and we try and support your children. Because, you know, these are some difficult times. I mentioned earlier that Wadley was under threat of closure. There are forces which seek, which seek to wreak havoc in our community. First Corinthian is a pillar of this community. Um, it's a, a spiritual dimension that I encourage all of us to at least explore and look at. But fathers, as you leave, what we want to say to you again, at the risk of saying this ad nauseum, we want to make sure that you understand this village of Wadley, as long as we're here, with the support of Mr. Benjamin, of course, Brother Jamal, um, Brother from the Mayor's Office, uh, Pastor Mike, all the parents, and especially the fathers, we're here to try and help you realize that dream. And in conclusion, I'm going to ask if you would just join hands for just a second. Maybe just join hands for the person that's next to you. And my last word is this. I, I you know, the circle is, a, is an African symbol of completeness. Um, and again, I think of something that, since we're talking about men, something that, that a, a, a brother who lived here in this community said. Sterling, um, Owen Dotson. And these were his words. He said, nothing happens only once. Nothing happens only here. Every love that lies asleep wakes today another year. Why we sailed and how we prosper will be lived and sung again. All the lands repeat themselves, sure for sure, and men for men. Having said that, again, we love you, we care about our future as a people, and we thank you for being here. We ask you, if you have the time, just to kind of talk to the fathers that are here. You may want to exchange numbers. Um, there's food here. Um, I know Ms. Green said that there was some lunches or something. So we would we be, that is what we're here to do. It's no accident I put these pictures here. Frederick Douglass, Symbols of Struggle, Martin Luther King. Howard Thurman, and of course, the power of these brothers that are in this room. So we thank you, um, and please, let's spread the love.